How should I manage database schemas from a Kubernetes cluster? You recommended Schema Hero, right? I did. But don't. Please, please, please don't use it. It's the best option, but it's bad, really bad. I think I found a better one. I'll let you know later. OK, thank you. Bye. Managing database schemas in Kubernetes is hard. No, wait, no. Hard is not the right word. It is silly, mostly because we do not have the right tools. We can wrap existing schema management solutions into containers and run them in Kubernetes as, let's say, jobs. But that is silly. That is not how we work in Kubernetes. We want to define resources and let Kubernetes do the rest. And to do that, we need custom resource definitions and controllers or operators. So if we exclude those solutions that were just wrapped into containers and without following what we consider best practices in Kubernetes, the only option, the only option, at least that I'm aware of, is Schema Hero. Schema Hero is the best solution for managing database schemas in Kubernetes. But at the same time, Schema Hero is horrible. How can that be, you might ask? How can something be the best and horrible at the same time? Well, that's easy. If you're the only option, you are the best option, no matter how bad you are. If you would compete in a race, let's say, and you're the only competitor, you will get gold medal for sure. You could run for a few meters, then take a rest, have lunch, have some coffee, and then walk the rest of the track and you would still win. You're the only one. That's similar to the situation of Schema Hero. It's the only option for those wanting to manage database schemas as Kubernetes resources. Hence, it is the best option. And what's the problem with Schema Hero? Well, there are quite a few. It supports only simple scenarios. It does not emit statuses, making it close to impossible to use with GitOps tools or to observe it. It does not have a decent way of installation and so on and so forth. I already explored some of the Schema Hero issues in that video. So I will keep repeating myself here. What matters, and I'll have to be honest here, is that I was promoting Schema Hero for a while, but that's because it was the only option that I was aware of. Now we get a second contender for managing database schemas in Kubernetes. It's a tool I already explored in this channel, and back then I was complaining that it does not work well in Kubernetes. They listened, and now it does. The tool is called Atlas, and besides previous methods for managing database schemas, it now has a Kubernetes operator. So the question is whether it is better than Schema Hero. The bar is very, very, very low, so it should not be hard to beat it. As a side note, this video has nothing to do with this video. Back then, I explored Atlas as a tool for managing database schemas outside Kubernetes, and I was complaining that it does not work well in Kubernetes. Today, I'm exploring Atlas Kubernetes Operator, which is a new addition to Atlas. That's enough talk. Let's see it in action. Let's take a look at a few resources. We have an Atlas schema with a specific name. And further down, there are credentials that tell Atlas how to connect to the database. There are a few ways we can provide credentials, and they are all, all wrong. Or to be more precise, one type is missing. If I would have many Atlas schemas, there would be too much repetition. Those 10 to 15 lines would need to be in each of them. It would make so much more sense to have something like Atlas schema credentials resource that would be referenced in Atlas schema. Now, that's not a big deal, so let's move on. Further down, we have schema itself, which can be HCL or, like in this example, SQL. Now, it makes no sense 
no sense at all to mix Kubernetes YAML with HCL. I understand how HCL might be a good choice outside Kubernetes, but inside Kubernetes manifests, no, no, it makes no sense. That's why you don't see it in this example. Over here, I'm defining schema in the SQL format. Now, the SQL itself might be confusing. If you know SQL, as I hope you do, you might think that this schema would work only the first time. After all, it says that it should create a table and that would fail miserably if the table already exists. It is not declarative, right? Well, wrong. Atlas will always, and I repeat, always create a table, but not inside the destination database. Instead, it will create that table in an ephemeral database, compare it with the destination database, calculate the differences, and then apply those differences in the destination database. It's actually a really good way to manage schema that has a lot of potential to avoid typical pitfalls other tools fall into. Anyways, from the end user perspective, what matters is that you can think of create table as just filler around declarative statements that define fields, relations, and other things we might need in databases. Would they prefer if the whole manifest is in Kubernetes format? Of course, I would. There is no good reason to mix one declarative format with one imperative format that acts as declarative. Nevertheless, SQL is widely accepted and known language, so it's still a better option than mixing YAML with HCL. One argument in favor of SQL is that every single DBA knows it, so there is nothing to learn. That argument is false, since there is everything else in Atlas schema to learn. Another argument would be that the Atlas team prefers SQL over other formats, but that is also not true. Atlas is on the mission to convince everyone that declarative formats are a better choice than SQL. It's been pushing HCL for a while now, and it's the preferred way to define schemas outside Kubernetes. It's just that Atlas is moving towards Kubernetes where HCL does not make any sense. So they opted for SQL as the default choice because the third option, pure Kubernetes YAML, would probably mean rewriting the whole Atlas engine. Now, to be clear, none of those things is a real problem. Everyone knows SQL, so it is quite okay to define the schema in that way, even though it might be a bit confusing and might not be the best choice. The alternative destination to define the schema is to store it as a config map and then reference it in Atlas schema. I think that that's silly as well. So I will pretend that there is no such option. No config map where I define SQL and then reference it in uh, Kubernetes resources. No, no, please no. Now, going back to the manifest, Further down, I have a second Atlas schema. There is nothing special about it. The only thing that you need to know for now is that I define two tables in two different schemas and that one references the other as a constraint. Now, let's apply those schemas by executing kubectl apply with all the banks and whistles. We can see that two schemas were created. And we can always retrieve schemas if we would like to see their statuses. Now, that ready column alone is a reason big enough to ditch Schema Hero in favor of Atlas. Kubernetes cannot manage resources without statuses. Schema Hero does not have statuses, so Kubernetes does not know what to do with it. I will not go deeper into it. As I already mentioned, watch this video over there uh, for some of the issues we face without statuses. Atlas does report statuses, hence that alone already makes it a winner. We can see all that in more detail if you output a schema to YAML. Look at that. That's a proper Kubernetes status with a message and the reason and the status and the type. Next, I will check my Postgres database and see whether schema was really applied, both of them. And to do that, I will exec into the database container, which, by the way, was created through CNPG Cloud Native Postgres, which is awesome, and you should check it out. I made a video over there. Uh, by the way, the links to all the videos I'm referencing is in the description, so check it out over there. Don't stop watching this video. 
don't. Next, I will enter the PSQL shell, switch to the app database and list all tables. Now, this is disappointing. Only one of the two tables are there. Atlas failed to create the second table, but there is a reason for that. As I already mentioned briefly, Atlas creates ephemeral databases, creates schemas, compares them to those in the destination database, and then applies the differences. And that works great, only when executing Atlas CLI, but not when running inside Kubernetes as different Atlas schema resources. You see, Atlas creates an ephemeral database for each Atlas schema resource. And that means that it created one database for the videos table and applied create table statement. Then it created another DB for the comments table and applied create table statement. And that one, the second, failed because the comments table references the videos table, but the videos table is in a different ephemeral database. What that means is that we have to define all the tables that reference each other in the same Atlas schema resource. Otherwise, well, it won't work. We can see that there is something wrong with the comments table by listing all Atlas schemas. It's stuck in the verifying first run state and it will stay stuck forever and ever. Now, let's take a look at the better definition of those two tables stored in videos dash one YAML. This is almost the same as the previous silly demo videos resource, except that both SQL schemas are now in it and the second resource is completely gone. With both tables defined in the same resource, Atlas will create a single ephemeral database, apply both schemas, and that should resolve the issue of comments referencing videos through the constraint and foreign key. But before we apply those changes, I want to check one more thing. Will Atlas delete tables if you delete Atlas schema resources? Let's run kubectl delete and see what happens. If I list the tables in the database, we can see that the table is still there. Now, I understand why Atlas does not delete tables. It spins up ephemeral databases, applies the schemas, and compares them with the schema in the destination database. It cannot delete tables that are not in the ephemeral database because it does not know which ones are managed by that Atlas schema resource, nor which one might not be managed by Atlas at all. However, this is the part where Atlas should have leveraged Kubernetes webhooks. It could have intercepted the request to delete Atlas schema and deleted whichever tables were defined in that schema resource. But that's not how Atlas works outside Kubernetes. So I guess that's not what they thought to do inside Kubernetes either. Now, that's a pity, since that would mean that I would have to delete tables manually or come up with some workaround. And truth be told, tables are not deleted often. Nevertheless, that's a feature that should be added to Atlas. It must be able not only to create and to update or edit, but also delete stuff. Now, let's get back to the manifest that contains both tables in the same resource and apply it. So, kubectl apply videos one YAML and backslash dt to list the tables in the database. And the second table is still not there. Let's wait for a few moments and list the tables again and voila, it's there. This time with all the tables defined in the same resource, Atlas did not have an issue with the constraint and foreign key in the ephemeral database. So it generated the schema, compared it with the destination database, decided that the table is missing and it created it. And that's brilliant. If you describe Atlas schema, we can see from the message that it created the table. So far we saw that it can create tables and that it cannot delete tables. Let's see whether it can alter tables. I have a modified version of the videos one YAML manifest. If you diff videos one and videos two, we can see that the field description was added. If you output videos two, we can see that the videos table now has the field description. Now, before I apply the modified version of the manifest 
Let me double check that the field is not already there by switching to PSQL and describing the table itself. The description column is not there. So let's apply the modified manifest, describe the table again, and the field was added. Great. If we describe Atlas schema, we can see from the message that this time he decided to alter the table by adding the missing column. And here's one more complaint. Even though the message is displaying correctly the last operation, the events are not. It is always saying apply schema. And I would like the events to be more precise. It would be great if I would see things like table X created, table Y altered, and so on and so forth. That would help a lot with observability. Besides creating, altering, and not deleting tables, Atlas has a few additional features mostly designed to prevent unintentional changes. One of those features is linting, which allows us to analyze migrations and detect and prevent potentially dangerous and unacceptable changes. Let's take a look at the difference between the manifest we applied and the modified version of it. We can see that I removed the title column, but also that I added lint policy that will treat destructive changes as errors. Now, to be clear, destructive in this context applied to destructive changes to columns and other properties of tables and not destruction of tables themselves, since as we already saw, Atlas does not delete tables. So let's see what will happen if we apply whatever is defined in videos 3 YAML and describe the Atlas schema. And we can see that it reported the proposed removal of the column as an error. And if I switch to PSQL and describe the videos table, the column is still there. Finally, the last example will be yet another modification of the manifest where I changed the linting policy to not treat destruction as errors by setting error to false. I also added the policy, but in the interest of time, I chose to comment it out. Uh, We're not showing it here. You can check what it does together with all the other features in the official documentation. So let's apply the changes and describe the Atlas schema. And this time, without the safety net of linting, Atlas chose to drop the column. We can confirm that's what really happened by describing the table through PSQL. And we can see that the column title is now gone. And that's enough for demo. Let's talk about Atlas Kubernetes operator pros and cons, the good and the bad. I can say right away that Atlas is a much better option than Schema Hero. There is no doubt about that, zero. Still, it's not perfect. And that imperfection is mostly due to the fact that Atlas was not designed for Kubernetes and that the operator was added recently. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Now, let's start with bad things. To begin with, the syntax was clearly ported from non-Kubernetes version of Atlas. As a result, we can define schemas as SQL or HCL. While SQL makes a lot of sense, Atlas itself has been pushing for HCL as the preferred way to define schemas. So the project itself thinks that SQL is not the best choice. On the other hand, HCL makes no sense as being embedded in Atlas CRDs. From my side, I will certainly not use HCL, so I'm going with what Atlas believes is the second best option, SQL. If Atlas was designed for Kubernetes, we would have SQL and YAML, not HCL as the options. Now, you might say that SQL is a perfectly valid uh, way to define schemas. Everyone knows it, so no one needs to learn anything new. The first part is true, everyone knows it. The second part is not, since there is something to learn, and that something is Atlas schema syntax for everything but schemas themselves. The disadvantage is that I cannot easily use it with other Kubernetes native tools. For example, if I would need more complex policies than what Atlas offers, I would probably employ Kyverno, but since we are not dealing with YAML but SQL, that would not work. There are many, many other examples where Atlas syntax with embedded SQLs would prove to be difficult if you would combine it with other Kubernetes tools. Next, the second, we cannot define separate Atlas schema resources for tables if those tables are related to each other. As you saw from the first example, 
that confuses the hell out of Atlas. That means that all schemas need to be defined in the same manifest, at least when those schemas are related to each other. And that will quickly make manifests too big and too hard to manage. Finally, we cannot delete tables by deleting Atlas schemas, which means that we have to delete them manually. Now, that might sound like a lot of cons, but it's not. As a matter of fact, a few months ago, my list was much, much larger, so I discarded Atlas at that time. However, the team behind Atlas was listening and they fixed most of the issues I had, so I can only assume that many of those listed here will be resolved soon as well. After all, the operator is in very, very, very early stages and it would be silly to expect it to be perfect from the start. Now, as far as the pros, I have only three, but they are big. To begin with, Atlas is much, much closer to proper database schema management tools like Liquibase or Flyway. Atlas itself is a robust and reliable tool that has been proven to work both in simple and complex scenarios. It's not a toy, which is not something I can say for Schema Hero. Spinning up ephemeral databases, comparing schemas, and generating migrations is a great way to manage schemas. For the second, Atlas Kubernetes Operator is an attempt to transform Atlas into Kubernetes native way of managing schemas. Now you might ask, why does it have to be Kubernetes native? And the answer is simple. Database schemas are related to applications, so it makes perfect sense to manage schemas in the same way we manage applications. That means that we want to define schemas as Kubernetes resources together with other resources that define applications. We might want to use GitOps tools to manage schemas, and we might want to observe them in the same way we observe applications. And all that means that it cannot be just a container that we run as a job. It needs to be a proper Kubernetes resource with statuses and everything else that comes with it. Schema Hero is not that. It is a proper Kubernetes resource, but it does not have statuses, and that makes it close to impossible to use it with GitOps tools or to observe it. And finally, it's open source. It's free. There is a commercial version in form of Atlas Cloud, and even that one has a free plan with relatively generous offer. Nevertheless, if you prefer to self-manage, you can do it completely free. Now, Atlas Kubernetes Operator is far from perfect, but it might be the best option we have at the moment, at least for those who want to manage database schemas as Kubernetes resources. Heck, Atlas is a great choice even for those who do not use Kubernetes, at least not for schemas. But that option, running Atlas outside Kubernetes, is not the subject of today's video. Atlas Kubernetes Operator is right now my preferred way to manage database schemas. Try it out and let me know what you think. See you in the next one. Cheers.